Uh, so I have had the pleasure of working with both of the gentlemen that I'm about to introduce. They are both deeply committed to the goal of bridging differences through the act of dialogue and taking others' perspectives. Joan Menarek has been a social work practitioner for many years, focusing on anti-oppression and social justice education in communities, organizations, and higher education settings. Education settings. And that's Joan Menarek, uh, MSW MPP. He is a coordinator for the Program on Intergroup Relations Dialogue Program, which offers courses to undergraduate students here at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. These courses focus on various social identity categories, including race, disability status, socioeconomic status, uh, class, uh, political ideology, and resisting marginalization. He is also a social work doctoral candidate with a research focus on state level direct lobbying policy advocacy and policy advocacy training design. He is an adjunct lecturer at UIUC's School of Social Work, teaching re research methods to social work graduate and undergraduate students and policy advocacy to MSW students. Joe has also been named a Teaching Academy Fellow for Universal Design and Learning by the Center for Innovation in Teaching and Learning at University of Illinois. Um, so now we're going to move on to Scott Bittner. Scott Bittner is a fifth generation farmer li living and working northwest of Champaign. Scott has also worked as an Ed Psych 203 facilitator, so that's the same uh, group of courses that Joe uh, helps uh, facilitate, uh, like coordinate. Uh, he has worked as a facilitator for that, uh, for that program for 12 sections of liberal, conservative, or religious diversity dialogue classes beginning in the fall of 2010 and the program for intergroup relations, so we call that PIR. Uh, Scott brings his experience from living and working in Springfield and Washington, D.C. as an intern while also a student at the University of Illinois. In addition to this, he served for five years as an intergovernmental liaison for the Office of International Activities, U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. He's traveled to Sao Paulo and Mexico City on a USG passport and as a member of private policy and business delegations to China, Hong Kong, Germany, and the Ukraine. He enjoys pol policy development and has extensive experience serving as executive director of agricultural uh, po uh, agricultural, political, media relations, and research nonprofits, and in leadership on several local boards and committees. So please give a warm round of applause for our wonderful facilitators today, Scott and Joe. Um, so thanks for the warm welcome. My name is Joe Maneric. Um, really appreciate the opportunity to come talk with you and actually engage with you in this examination of bridge, bridging, the, bridging the divide. Um, so let's see. There's a couple of things that we're going to be looking at today. And again, this is going to be much more um, interactive rather than um, a couple of us talking at folks. Um, our perspective is that there's a lot of wisdom um, in our collective knowledge about being with other human beings. Um, it's a fundamental issue that we look at with the intergroup relations dialogue classes. Um, and so we're going to be tapping into that wisdom today as well. So there are really two different um, objectives that we're shooting for today. Looking at the things that actually create division, um, exploring our experiences to figure out what, what we might learn about what pulls people apart, um, repels each other. And then also looking at um, ways where we can actually um, engage and the sort of tricks of the trade of engaging, especially when it gets tough. So. Um, Scott and I have our own perspectives and experiences. We're going to talk a little bit about that in this process um, as a sort of introduction. There'll be an opportunity for us to take a little bit of a video clip, assuming it works, um, to kind of set the tone a little bit. Um, and then we're going to be looking to you for your own experiences and insights. Is that cool? Mm -hmm. You don't have sound set up? Yeah. Okay. Sure. Well, Scott, do you want to share yeah. your perspective? What are we doing? 
share your perspective. You can use this if you want. No, I'm going to stand up here. Okay. Yeah. Does that work? <laughs> is it is it going to do well or not? It should be okay. That one's too hot for the other two to be loud enough. So weird. So if you use that one, then. Okay. Good. Well, thanks for thanks for having us here. Uh, if we were able to flip back, maybe Joe can do that to yeah. the very first page, uh, to the to the opening one that had our names on it. Uh, you'll see it says Scott Bidner and Joe Menarik. Uh, so. Joe is, a, Joe is a facilitator for, I'm, he's been my boss essentially for, he doesn't pay me very much, uh, for about six years and I've done 12, 12 different sections of liberal conservative or religious, liber, religious diversity. Uh, so he's being, uh, when he put my name first, he's being magnanimous. But the other reason that I'd like to have his name first is if this doesn't go well, I think he should take the majority of the blame. So. Well, I'm, I'm happy to be here. So when this invitation to, to talk about the post-election uh, uh, was offered to Joe and I for a Friday forum, uh, he and I were working this spring on the third floor of the education building do, doing another section of liberal conservative dialogue. That was a half a year ago. Uh, the phenom that was the election was just starting to gather some steam. Uh, the election was pretty standard though. Remember all the candidates that we had? Uh, and there was still a need for dialogue then. We really, we really were in desperate need. And then Tuesday happened, and I would posit that we are still in dire need of, of something called dialogue. So I have a certain level of comfort being here today. Uh, I, I'm a graduate, a graduate of this, uh, this institution. My mom and dad uh, met here. My mom lived in the YWCA uh, uh, in the 50s. Uh, and Joe's office is just right upstairs over one of these flags. And so we go there each week to be trained and, and and wisdom to be dispatched. You dispatch wisdom, you impart wisdom. That's what you do. Uh, but I'm, I'm also here with a certain level of humility. Uh, when these, the speaker announcements were posted this summer, I was walking to church one sunny summer morning. Uh, I had parked my pickup and I met two friends. One had just parked his Prius and the other parked his bicycle. Uh, and so uh, one of them said, well, I've just seen that this, the speaker's posted. And he said, looking right at me, usually they have experts. <laughs> Yet it's good to have friends. The other said, when can we get together and talk about what the Republican Party has done wrong for the last 50 years? So these are, these are two good people that I know. So what's the point of this dialogue thing? In my past life, I would agree, by profession, I have been an advocate for agriculture, nonprofits, for EPA, working with Department of Commerce, Exim Bank, USAID. Uh, and in the last few years, I've hosted press conferences on our farm with a future governor, Rahner, and a Republican senator. By the way, the liberal conservative dialogue classes necessarily have to have a liberal. Joe agreed to play that role. Uh, I've played the role of the, of the other, not the other as in marginalization, but the other, the other side. <coughs> So why dialogue? Why not always advocacy and debate? Because, di because debate and demonization don't always work. They seldom create any meaningful, lasting agreements in this country. Are the parties, politicians, and pundits, the vast cons conspiracy of the three Ps, uh, in favor of dialogue? Almost certainly not. They measure success by victory and would likely describe dialogue either as the height of folly, the height of ignorance, or maybe the height of naivete, and maybe we're guilty of all that. I did, maybe you do too. Uh, it's, important, it's an important uh, component of liberal conservative training for students uh, to do perspective taking. So when I was a freshman, uh, heading home for Thanksgiving, I caught a ride with a friend of mine, and we were headed north on Lincoln Avenue, and were stopped uh, by the train crossing on University. And as we got to that, we saw somebody coming on South Lincoln, uh, on the north side of university, uh, and they had pulled too far under the gate. And we watched in amazement. We're not bad people, but we couldn't help but laugh. We could see that gate coming down, and it was surely going to hit their hood. And from the gate at that point, there used to be an arm that would swing down, and it was stationed right in the middle of where your hood was. And we looked in amazement. We couldn't believe how stupid those people were. We were just flabbergasted and we were laughing. And that gate came down and it hit the middle of their hood 
And at the same moment, it hit our hood too, on the other side. <laughs> so that's a, need, that's a good story for, we, we need perspective taking. Uh, dialogue is meant to create understanding. We listen to learn. And maybe, just maybe, we find ways to advance political ideas. Uh, John Haight, is he, was he a, a colleague of yours? Yeah. Uh, he's a social psychologist at New York, New York University. I thought he had been here for a while. Says that universities are unlike any other institutions in that they absolutely require that people challenge each other so that the truth can emerge from limited, biased, flawed individuals. He further writes that if they lost intellectual diversity or if they developed norms of safety that trump, lowercase, challenge, Trump challenge, then they die. I read that as in terms of dialogue, uh, can be a challenge, not in terms of debate, but, but can be challenge. Since parties and pundits and politicians favor debate for victory, we might conclude that the experts might be right, that we can only move forward by clashing. But I'm suggesting that we consider some alternatives. Are their objectives, the, policy, the, the politicians and pundits, are their objectives the same as our objectives? Uh, so here's the, here's the context. I could suggest that any number of people in this room, myself included, have acted in favor of a party objective. Uh, and I want you to listen to that with, with citizen ears, not as a, not as a something provocative, uh, but what's best for us all. Adams and Hamilton uh, were said to say that they didn't think there should be political parties, saying they only lead to divisiveness and theater. I can't find that quote to back it up. I'm sure I heard it. I hope it's right. If it's not, it should be true. Uh, but there are other schools of thought on this political nation of ours. Historian uh, Douglas Brinkley was quoted in the Times column saying, this election has been a hell broth of stew that's been tacky and tawdry, but the reason a lot is coming out is because we've been avoiding the big conversations. Now we're discussing what our culture should be like, how unfiltered we want it to be, if we want to engage other countries, and whether our institutions are trustworthy. He writes, this historian, before the Civil War, everyone was trying to make compromises on slavery and not talk about it. When Lincoln was elected, all the issues came to a head. Emily May, in the same column, uh, who co-founded the anti-sexual harassment campaign called Hollaback, explained that one strategy in social change is polarization, where you create heated moments that force people to choose a side. She acknowledged, however, that that can be a double-edged sword, and it was specifically so, I think, in this election. So if debate and division aren't always the answer, and we are forced to conclude that dialogue must be a part of our public conversation, I guess we have to ask why. And the answer is, if we always do what we always did, we'll always get what we always got. Uh, Frank Luntz, the pollster, was on 60 Minutes uh, this week, and he said that the electorate is held together by the thinnest of threads. Never in his 20 years of experience has he seen such emotion, so many personal attacks, and division. He would say, I'm paraphrasing, he didn't use this word, we are doomed, doomed. I won't say that word anymore today. But let me suggest in politics it was ever thus. Hero politician Abraham Lincoln, who the, neighbor, the, who the nation remembers with awe and reverence, as a student, I'm sure most of you have been there, I sat uh, in his memorial and wrote, hand wrote some of the quotes uh, that are inside uh, things that he had written. So I'm, I'm in this, this edifice to this great president. But did you know, when he was a young politician working in Springfield, that he used to write letters demonizing his political opponents and didn't even use his name. He signed it as using the name of a young woman. So I guess that gives us hope, maybe, I don't know. Maybe he didn't want to know that. Uh, if you want further proof that politics is in need of a helping hand from citizens engaged in dialogue, you don't have to look very far back to find that some felt so righteous in their beliefs that they assassinated Presidents Lincoln, President Kennedy, uh, and political leader Martin Luther King. Or take a look way back to 44 BC and what happened to the poet and general uh, and author Caesar. So to put things a, a little more in perspective, if you want to be happy today, I know there's, lot, there's a protest going on as we speak, uh, Chuck Grassley, I think, was just reelected in Iowa, and Charles Schumer uh, was reelected as well, and I don't, I don't think either one of those will, will come to blows. Author James Patterson wrote that a man from ancient Rome said it is better to know nothing about a subject than to know half of it. And I think that calls on us as citizens to take the time to be informed and be ready to dialogue. 
Uh, we have a college student in our church that, as a part of a class project, went to visit Israel and Palestine. She had some opinions about which side she agreed with more. Some of those might have come from her class, some from her parents. And so they went, this, this whole uh, group of students, they went and stayed for a week with, with a family in Palestine. They, then they switched. They stayed with the family uh, on the other side. And I, I don't know if they went back and forth, but they lived with families. They weren't in a hotel. They weren't watching, watching videos and reading books. They lived with families. And her interesting conclusion was that I thought I knew a lot about that subject. So what they say is if you go to, to Israel and Palestine for a week, that you could probably write a book about it. If you've been there two weeks, you might be down to an essay. And if you stay a month, you're maybe down to a paragraph on what you think you really understand. So complex is the situation. So finally, I want to close with this. There's, a, there's been a long-standing controversy in this community regarding jail expansion versus treatment, versus a more, a more humane look. And I, I might speculate that some in this room might have been involved. I had opinions and have opinions about that. I don't want to talk about that, but I do want to ask you the question, why is it in politics that we often act as judge and jailer for those that oppose us or disagree with us politically? We too hastily slap the mental handcuffs on people. We slam uh, in our mind a satisfyingly heavy metal door on, the, on those that oppose us. Uh, and we're off, and we, we throw away the key. We're often convinced of our own righteousness, of our own uh, infallibility to condemn our, fel our fellow citizens. So in class on Wednesday, uh, we're gonna talk about immigration. We try to be relevant in our liberal conservative dialogues, and I think, I think we will be. We've, done, we've talked about immigration any number of times before, but maybe it's especially relevant now. So one of the, one of the things that we're gonna do uh, we, we send out a writing assignment to students. We use a Senate Judiciary Committee hearing, uh, which has an expert on both sides. So back to, the, back to how, much, how much information you have. We listen and read from, from experts that have opposing positions, and we do that in the privacy of our dorm room or our office or wherever. Um, and then we ask them to write about it. And then even the uh, next step, and maybe even more difficult, we ask them to come back the next week, this is gonna happen Wednesday, and talk about it for two hours. And we do that in a, in a safe space. Our very first class period is, set, putting, is spent uh, setting ground rules. What would it take for you to participate? Joe's gonna talk about this some more. What would it, make, what would it take for you to shut down? What would, you, what would, it, what would make you want to dialogue? What would scare you uh, and keep you from wanting to do that? So I look forward to these sessions. They're successful if I have a slight headache at the end. I feel like we've, we've really worked something over. There can be some heat, to be sure, but it should never end that way, and it, and it does not. Uh, we've had a session or two on that subject that, that, that's ended, even after a raucous exchange, uh, with some applause and people patting backs on the way out. So that's, that's the hope, that's the thing we're talking about today, and we'll go from here, so you're up. Great, thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Scott. Um, so as I was listening, one of the things, I, I wanted to pick up on a couple of points that I think are critical. Um, big conversations. And the imperative for us to figure out what I see as sort of the technology of being able to carry off big conversations. Um, and what I realized as Scott was talking, you know, we've been doing these intergroup dialogue classes on this campus um, beginning in 1998. University of Michigan started doing these intergroup dialogue classes for undergraduate students even before that time. Um, across the country, there are programs where we're inviting young people to actually look at um, how to have big conversations in productive, generative sort of ways. And what I was realizing as I was listening to Scott and big conversations, issues around polarization, we, to the extent that this is a meaningful, useful thing for us to engage in as citizens, as members of society, where decisions are being made by lots of people, not necessarily in this room, but who need information and knowledge to make better decisions. I think part of our challenge is what are the technologies that we can tap into that support 
and empower us to have these big conversations, including with people that don't necessarily see eye to eye with us where we're coming from. And what I realize is that, and honestly, this has been my experience with the Intergroup Dialogue Program. Um, year after year, semester after semester, we, in this training process that Scott talks about, we've been figuring out how do we do this better? How do we do this more effectively? Um, what are the things that we as sort of leaders within the space of the, the group or the classroom, what do we need to be doing and not doing in order to get these things off the ground week after week, semester after semester, year after year? Students, this is a, so part of my social work experience, um, you know, I need to believe in and have faith in my fellow human being. I need to believe that people are motivated um, to be better and to create a better society. Um, I'm not going to allow that belief to be shaken easily. Um, it comes close sometimes. You know, when I see and hear some of the stuff that goes on in a society like this one or in our communities, um, and I'm still going to hold on. I still need to believe in the capacity of each of us to be better human beings tomorrow than we are today. I hold this out for us as facilitators of these intergroup dialogue classes. I hold it out for each of us in this room, certainly of our students. And I think holding our expectations higher is part of the imperative. Um, what do we believe is possible? But again, having a belief needs to be supported by those sorts of things. And this is where I was coming back to what Scott was saying. Technology, what are the tricks that we can count on um, or we might be able to rely upon that are actually going to facilitate what we're talking about in terms of these objectives, you know? Figuring out the things that get in the way of connecting with other human beings, especially those who don't think, believe, have similar experiences as we do. Um, what are the things that we have discovered that actually support us moving from point A to point B in this process of sustained generative engagement. Um, and polarization is a big deal. It's something that we need to keep in mind continuously of the things that we do that I think fit this first category of those, those mechanisms of division. Um, so what we initially were going to do was look at this um, Stephen Colbert clip, but I think I'd like to kind of move forward. I don't know that we necessarily need that. Um, let me just share one of the things that I think is, is really um, exciting about the intergroup relations work and the discoveries that we're doing. Scott's mentioned this thing about perspective taking. In the empirical literature and in our practice of working with students around intergroup relations, where we're bringing students together to have big conversations about race, about policies like affirmative action, um, sexual orientation, disability status, abortion. Um, we've kind of discovered about six key learning objectives that are really sort of both knowledge but really actually much more so skill sets. Scott mentioned perspective taking. We've gone beyond kind of just saying, oh, you need to be empathetic. Um, perspective taking from my orientation is kind of captures three different dimensions, one of which is how successful am I, how accurate am I at being able to kind of anticipate what somebody else is thinking in relation to X? Relatively accurate or off the mark? That's a big deal. Second dimension, how accurate might I be at figuring out what they're probably feeling in relation to X, whatever that X is. It could be a policy, it could be an event, it could be an experience. The third has to do with sort of perceptual cues. Am I kind of able to figure out what they're picking up on that leads them to think, feel, et cetera, in relation to X? And what we've discovered in the intergroup dialogue program is that helping students really develop high-end skills around perspective taking, no, kind of being able to accurately guess what other people are saying and where they're coming from, what they're thinking, what they're feeling, what they're picking up on, is a big deal. This is also one of the key features of prejudice reduction from the prejudice reduction literature, perspective taking. Now notice again what gets in the way of perspective taking on a general level, to the extent that you've been able to not be with people like that, whatever that is, to whatever extent you've been able to get away with 
living in a de facto segregated space, you're probably not going to be in a position to even hear people, let alone be able to do the high-end perspective taking and the complexity, sort of embrace the complexity of multiple folks over there thinking about X, looking at X, feeling about X. So de facto segregation is one of the first things that is going to get in the way and maintain the divide. So who you hang out with and who you don't. We're creating spaces where students can come together. There are already somewhat, some of them, many of them, are motivated for this diversity thing. They're saying the campus is a space where we can engage with diversity. I want to know how to do that. So, you know, we're already sort of moving those spaces and we invite people from various backgrounds, perspectives, social identities in every class. And we specifically use those people, their stories, their thoughts and experiences as an opportunity to develop perspective taking. They're in the same room for two hours a day for seven weeks. I mean, two hours a week for seven weeks. This is an opportunity for us to ask them to tell stories and figure out whether or not people are able to hear those stories deeply. So one of the things that we want to do is look at your own experiences, engaging with people from different divergent perspectives on issues of importance to you, and the things that have gotten in the way of you being able to hang in there. And for example, come to a place of like rich, robust perspective taking. So what we want you to do right now is turn to a human. Find somebody around you. Go ahead, do that now. Pair up. I'm going to give you instruction. So after you find, after you find someone, if somebody doesn't have a partner, please let us know. Raise your hand. That is the Okay, so here's what I want you to do. Um, hang on, folks. These are instructions. And by the way, this is what we typically do on the first class for the liberal conservative political ideology dialogue. Talk about a time when you try to engage in an important discussion that's related to politics with another human being, and it fell apart. It flatlined, blew up, whatever that was. So one person gets to talk while the other person gets to listen. And the person who's listening just kind of take in the story. Okay, we'll give you a chance to switch so that everybody gets a chance to tell a story. Is that cool? After you tell stories, then we'll find out sort of people's experiences and try to notice, again, mechanisms that kind of undermine staying in there and hanging in there, bridging that divide. Is that cool? So the person who gets to go first. Oh, let's see. Person who's been um, in Champaign, Urbana, and its area, the longest. You get to go first. Is that, is that privileging? Yes, it is. So you'll get about a minute and a half. Person number one, begin. Okay, person number one, finish up your story and switch to person number two. 
talk about a time when you tried to have an engaged conversation and it fell apart. Okay, so, now finish up your stories, and so we don't have a portable microphone, um, which, is, which is a bummer, um, but what I'd like to do is have somebody talk, share, share really briefly the, the story, your, your experience, and what do you think broke down? And I, I'm going to, please, please. We will have a chance to do questiony stuff, yeah. But may as well. One. Thank you. Thank you very much for your for your talk. I very much appreciate what you've done on campus previously. I really. Uh, I love your um, take on things. But uh, my name is Aliyah, and I'm a TA in the Department of Communication. I'm also like, have been doing debate collegiately and coaching and teaching it now in classes and argumentation classes for about 10 years. Um, so my identity is deeply rooted in debate. And what I'm wondering is what you define debate as, because that's pretty hazy here, and what you define as deliberation, because what I'm hearing is bad debate and not good debate which I think that there are, are, both exist. And I'd like to offer, to my question is, uh, how is advocacy different than debate? Because I would say presidential debate is a misnomer. I don't think that that is, yeah. Shall, shall we answer this, or do you want to continue with your exercise and write this question down? I, I, um, really briefly, I think we'll just respond to it. Is okay. that cool? So debate is typically very, very structured. You have pro and con. You have pretty much dichotomized, polarized sort of positions on an issue. Some people don't even have to necessarily um, believe the position that they're assigned to defend and argue for in that sort of exercise. Um, we're really looking at sort of a dialogue, which is as we define it in our classrooms, and um, what we encourage students to recognize is that there's an opportunity to not necessarily pursue winning of the exchange, but actually promote collaborative sense making and understanding. So the dialogue stuff that we do is really this opportunity for people to not necessarily have fully formed arguments and perspectives because quite frankly, when you're asking people to talk about stuff they've never really thought about before and we need their stories and perspectives as information and aspects of society and living, sometimes we're gonna get fragments. And so part of our challenge is to create a space where people's fragments and even stuff, you know, just thinking out loud is given permission to breathe and be wrestled with collaboratively, not in terms of who's gonna win and who's gonna lose, but this is really an opportunity to, pr to promote deeper understanding of the complexity that Scott has, has talked about. So it really is a different orientation. We'll talk about resources that you can use to get an even better understanding of this thing called dialogue that we use, um, but Deborah Flick, Dialogue, the Understanding Process is one of the chapter, is one of the books that we recommend to students and we require them to read this stuff first, to notice the differences between debate, dialogue, and discussion. I also wanna say, I love debate, and there's a place for debate. 
Um, debate also encourages people to investigate and think really hard about the stuff, whatever the stuff is, whatever the issue is that's been assigned or that's going to be the topic of focus. Um, so I like that and I tell people, wouldn't it be cool if everybody came to a dialogue class where the ambition, the aim is to promote deliberative sense making and you know, like wrestle with each other collaboratively as, as colleagues and people who did the same amount of preparation and homework that they would do if this was a debate. Spend a week thinking about finding evidence, putting together your perspective, right? And come prepared that way with that much thought and consideration. And again, I think that's also one of the avenues to move toward wrestling with the complexity of these issues that we're talking about. So, great question, and yeah. I appreciate the clarification. And, and it is, and, and very briefly, uh, I didn't mean to, to imply it was either or, uh, certainly not. Uh, when I invited uh, the, the future governor to our farm for a press conference, I did not have uh, dialogue in mind. And dialogue isn't, isn't what happened when, when, when that was going on. Uh, what we say to stu students, and I love covering Flick because it isn't, it isn't an either or, but it's a really important part of our political process, particularly if we only look at it from the debate side. So we'd like to say the whole judicial system is based on debate. We need some hard answers to things. We don't want engineers having a dialogue about how strong the concrete should be in a bridge. I want the bridge to stand up. There, that can be black and white. But the complexity that Joe's talked about again and again uh, in things political call for dialogue often if we're to move forward. And I, you know, uh, Joe and I both know where C-SPAN is on our television dials, uh, and we watch stuff like that and enjoy a lot of that stuff. So it's, it's not an either or. So, so let's hear stories. Um, some brave, so again, make your story kind of a synopsis. Is that, is that a, I'm blind, by the way, so if you're raising your hand, raise it and wave it wildly, and I'll see you. Do we see anybody, Scott? Not a soul? Yes. Um, so, we actually had a very uh, interesting conversation because, well, both of us um, have had, I guess, the privilege of not having to, have, in recent memory, having had conversations with someone who had um, opposite views of us. We have had people who have a very different, um, where it's been one person had a, a more leftist view and one person Great. more centrist view. Great. Um, So when we engage with people who don't see things with us eye to eye, you know, there is this risk of we're going to actually increase discomfort. And you're saying in some ways that's the kind of risk that will perturb the relationship. And so you might actually say I'd prefer the relationship versus the risking of the relationship. Is that accurate? Perfect, perfect. What else? What other stories do people have? Well, you were all quite talkative. Something happened. I text argument with my son today. Oh. Text argument with your son. Technology as a barrier to good communication. Emotions running high. Emotions running high. Simplistic language, itself, accusations. And okay. And I would say that having distance and not as, as much face time and time together actually indicated that so we didn't have a trust basis. So physical distance, right? Okay. Even lack of the amount of time. Because again, I, I start thinking about the interactions people have and how we navigate communications. We pick up small cues to figure out, you know, is somebody on board? Are they nodding, right? Does that make sense? 
So we have to use these things continuously as feedback. And you're suggesting an email exchange or text exchange really can set us up for not being able to read the complexity of communication. Cool. <coughs> Other examples? Yeah. So, you know, and I start thinking when you're talking about being dropped from distribution lists or email lists, right? I think, what a profound statement. If I don't like what you say, I just simply stop talking, right? How brilliant. Or, we can do that virtually. You. We can also do that yeah. in other ways. You, you disrupted the echo chamber, and that's one of the issues. Technology has been brought up a couple of times. Um, I see some Facebook friends in here, and I see one in particular that I don't have political discussions with anymore because I like him too much. Uh, and we can't, we can't convey, we can't, as Joe said, we can't, we can't read language, we can't understand the whole process if we're, if we're using, he's smiling by the way, uh, if, if we are truncated in that, in that sort of a way. I was on, a, on the chisel plow on a tractor north and west of Champaign probably two falls ago, and there was a great segment about uh, Facebook and other, other ways that we communicate uh, through technology. And, and echo chamber, and there were some other, other words used to say, we only, we wanna, we, when we speak, we wanna just have our thoughts verified. And that was, you know, dialogic view to provide some, some language, but you missed the point. You were supposed to click yes or like. So again, I, I start thinking about, well, de facto segregation. Now we have virtual segregation, right? Which listservs are we part of and which ones are we not? Which ones are we being included in? Which ones are we being dropped? Um, thinking, again, very dynamically about who we're exposed to versus the echo chamber that Scott's talking about, I think is a big deal and will continue to be a big deal. Will continue to be a big deal. Um, one of the things that, in terms of the intergroup relations stuff, is challenging when we start looking at people getting, feeling um, uncomfortable or feeling discomfort, is social distance, okay? Um, so looking at the issue of race, white people, if we start feeling nervous about talking about race or we feel like we're going to screw up or get jammed up or whatever that is, right, say the wrong thing. And again, it doesn't mean that we're ill-intentioned necessarily, we just don't have that much exposure. There's lots of reasons why we might not be particularly capable of talking um, without tripping over ourselves around issues of race. Well, one option is to pursue talking about race and developing skills. Thinking about this stuff, reading about it, practicing, working, to kind of put our thoughts together. Another, which a lot of people can use and do use, social distance. We just stop. We don't put ourselves in positions to have our thinking examined, noticed, et cetera. So again, we can also create the kind of separation that we're seeing other people can kind of push us into as well. Other stories? No, you're just, please.
Your, your concerns are spot on. Um, I think, and we'll, we'll talk about this toward, toward the end of today, but what we are trying to talk about and push on today and this afternoon, and I think a lot of other venues are similarly kind of trying to wrestle with this, um, what we're talking about is really heavy lifting. This is a lot of work, and I think part of the work requires that we be more than just sort of um, naively, um, uh, what's the word? I think the idea of engaging with other people in a substantive sort of way needs to be done very mindfully. I think we need to take care of ourselves, um, not to the point necessarily where we fall into the pattern or the trap of segregating ourselves and putting ourselves in these echo chambers, um, remembering that that's a trap, but also, at the same time, being mindful that this is really hard work. Listening to folks that we don't see eye to eye with, who might be saying some things that are really hard, I think we need to be doing strategically. And we need to be prepared for it. So it's not a 24-7 sort of thing that I think most of us are capable of, of, of engaging in. So I, th I think being strategic and being thoughtful and really also assessing who I want to engage with and how and when is part of self-care. So I think that's, that's really part of it. And again, the balance is the challenge, falling into this place where I'm just surrounding myself with other people who think just like me, um, is setting me up for not hearing, not listening, not practicing my skills of listening deeply and trying to make sense of information, ideas, perspectives that aren't as familiar to me. Yeah. Uh, this is not following your parameters, but I feel uh, really important to bring this up, which is, given all the ferment about economic injustice that consumed the Bernie movement, the youth, and the, even the upwelling of support for that here, did you add anything about that kind of a subject to your, your panoply of subjects you talk about? And I'm sure you could find some conservative uh, students to argue with about economic justice, taxation, et cetera, that. Did you happen to add any of that to your curriculum? Well, we actually have a dialogue that's focusing on socioeconomic class status. And so when we start looking at class-based inequality and, you know, like how you define the problem is prescriptive, what is the problem? It didn't you know, come up in your description, so I just wanted to verify. We, yeah. we, we have had uh, at least four or five times in liberal conservative uh, a role of government sort of a thing, and it talks about uh, it talks about just those sorts of things. Different contexts sometimes depending on the makeup of the students and whether or not there are liberal and conservatives. Uh, somebody that can help carry the load and, and, and really bring some diversity to it, but absolutely. So I, I want to shift a little bit just to give folks a chance to think. I don't know what that says. Um, what are the tricks of the trade in terms of keeping open staying connected, even pursuing sort of connection with people, what are the things that people have identified that have actually been more successful kind of strategies? What do you think you need in terms of coming into those situations that actually help, help you hang in there during these situations? Yeah. So remembering the relationship rather than seeing yourself as, or the other person as representatives of these positions. Is that, did I catch that? Yeah. Uh, respect. Respect.
assumptions and premises on which they're basing their things, the things that they say, uh, and just keeping an open heart, not that, and, and remembering that you may not convince everybody, and that you can still get along usually, even if you disagree. Okay. Other things that people have been doing. Go ahead. I, I think a certain amount of self-awareness about um, about my own convictions and why I think the way I do, and an ability to articulate the connection between who I am and what my experiences are, and why I why I have a certain opinion, um, is critical to being able to engage someone else's story in a meaningful way. And actually, the whole idea of sort of recognizing the self and the other simultaneously recognizing this issue of humanizing, but also self-monitoring, right? Noticing what you're feeling and thinking continuously, even having thought about stuff beforehand, so that you can now be in a position to actually listen and engage somebody else from their perspective and stay listening rather than, as you were talking about, um, being oriented toward convincing, you know? But being present, I think, is an imperative. Are there other two, two factors to add to that, too, would be notice who's not, if you're in a dialogue, and if you're in a di dialogue like this, maybe not, but in a class of 16 or 18 or 20 people, who's not speaking? And when Joe said monitor yourself, that means if you're really, uh, really an elegant speaker uh, and you like to opine, noticing how much time you take. Are you leaving space in the room for other people? Are you, are you dominating without meaning to? How are other people receiving what you're saying? So again, self-awareness becomes a big deal, and yes. No, you're, you're, again, great question. I think part of the challenge is, I, first, I need to believe in the humanity of everyone else around me. I need to reaffirm that and remind myself that everybody's human, everybody has, you know, has parents and, you know, et cetera. I also realize talking with family members for years and years and years where the topic, for example, of me, this white guy at the university talking about race and race relations and anti-racism wasn't the most welcome topic. Um, especially during, you know, Thanksgiving, if you will, um, and those kinds of events, I've had to be strategic. I've had to figure out, you know, there are some people who aren't in a place where they're really going to come here and try to figure out the tricks of the trade of dialogue. I need to figure out who those folks are, because those are probably the people that if I try to engage in this humanizing way to, to bridge the divide, they're not interested in hearing or listening or learning or, you know, collaborative sense making. Okay, so I read those. I don't diminish their humanity. I just know that they're not in a place for what I'm interested in doing at this moment. Um, what I've also realized is that young people, you know, nieces and nephews in my case, are typically ones that are more open, have been exposed to more things, so there's some, probably some generational stuff going on. I've chosen to think, well, if I engage in a relationship with my nephew, from the time he's in the sixth grade to the time he's now a sophomore in college and develop a relationship with him, be patient, listen to what he's saying and how it might reflect some stuff that maybe parents, maybe grandparents or grandfather, you know, has been saying for years and years and years at family gatherings and put all that into context to remember his humanity when he says something a little bit weird, that helps me stay in that relationship. Even though it's kind of uncomfortable for me to hear this, but what I've also realized is putting six or eight years of investment in the relationship has created a foundation for, in this case, my nephew and I to really talk about things in a much deeper way than I can talk about these sorts of things with other people. 
So I've realized that the investment is a big deal, but I also, I also chose to be very strategic about it. By the time Thanksgiving usually rolls around, our students have been practicing dialogue through exercises and readings and writings and that sort of thing for about five weeks. So we purposely send them home into some of those situations. We really do. That's the assignment. Armed, in a, not in a peaceful sort of way armed, uh, with, with some of those tools. Uh, one of the things, as, as Joe was talking, made me think of it. I don't, we, have, we have an exercise that we do in class called Racist Uncle Joe. <laughs> Joe's not racist, but maybe Joe wrote the exercise. I'm not sure. We just picked that name. Uh, and so when you go back to Thanksgiving, the way that you posed the question, uh, it would have been a dialogue among equals. Well, is it, is it equal if grandmother or granddad is talking to the, the, the grandchild? Is it equal if a parent is, you know, you, you get the point. Uh, the answer is no, and so Joe likes complexity. We further complicate by saying, well, if this happened, these are ways that you could approach it. Uh, but the further complexity comes, comes that if, if racist Uncle Joe is paying for your college education, then what can you say? Can you take a risk? Will you take a risk? Should you take a risk? Is it important? What's the subject? Are you, are you maybe helping him save face in, in some cases? So lots of ways, but that's, that's a really relevant question because our students are going to go home with an assignment to have a conversation over Thanksgiving. So this also um, begs the question, how do we bu build capacity to doing things like this? Um, and so again, in the context of this structured learning experience, the dialogue classes, we have these assignments where we say, okay, we just had a discussion about X. Now, go out and find two other human beings to have the same discussion, use this question, find out what they think. So with affirmative action, which is one of the policies that we're looking at this coming week, I say, okay, again, let's rehumanize everybody. Everybody has an opinion about that thing. What's your opinion before you read any of the assigned readings? What's your opinion about affirmative action? Now talk to two other people. What's their perspective on, on affirmative action? Now read the materials and think, how is this affecting your own thinking about affirmative action? What I realized when we were working with white students specifically around race issues is that they were going back to families where they were getting a lot of pushback. And so what I realized is kind of by happenstance in some ways, we needed to inoculate them. We needed to have, help them prepare for the pushback that they're probably gonna get, but not in the demonizing way, right? It's not like seeing those people back home are all goofy. It's really, no, you know, they're not being exposed and hearing and wrestling with the same stuff you are. They got other things going on. So it doesn't make them bad people. It just means that some of your ideas are gonna be seen as really weird and strange. So how can you build capacity? And again, I see it as helping students inoculate themselves so that they can wrestle with things and stay in there without feeling crushed or marginalized, et cetera. And again, I go back to being strategic. For some people I can engage in much more so um, with some of these ideas, and I've listened long enough to figure out what are their hot button topics that aren't gonna work, and which ones are there, is there more sort of latitude? And again, I've found that nieces and nephews and younger cohorts are typically much more open for various reasons, including exposure to social media, to wrestling with more of the complexity. You're not necessarily gonna come, and I, my aim is not necessarily to make them come to my point of view. My aim is to invite more complexity, more richness of thinking around these topics, because here's just like with our students in classes. We have seven sessions, two hours a week, where we're gonna engage this stuff. After that, I'm hoping that we're giving them the skills to stay engaged with really tough issues, but also with people who are presenting other elements of complexity and toughness to any issue. So this is a skill building process, and I see it as a long-term project. Five minutes past, you want to get to the rest of Sure. So, um, epilogue, do you want to talk? Do you want to read the epilogue? Go ahead. No, I can't see it. So. Oh. It's yours. I, it's the blindness thing, man. You always get some. Wow, money. I really get sensitivity points there. Yeah, Thanks a lot, Joe. Don't worry about it, dude. I love you. This, this is uh, Wednesday in class was the day after the election. Our class is at three o'clock, and it lasted until five. And it was a fairly fairly raw sort of day. When you when we talk about dialogue, it might not be the thing that you want to do right after somebody something happens uh, that they cared a lot about. So this is the note we put together to our students, uh, and the, the immigration, the immigration uh, assignment followed. Uh, so dialogue is heavy lifting. It is hard work, and it can be antithetical to our usual response to ideas different from our own. 
It might be the height of irony that the same politicians that incited us to extreme partisan positions are now calling for understanding and forgiveness. It's odd that after so many contentious months of partisan demonization that the electorate is just expected to calm down, chill out, and move on. It is, however, a moment for those that practice dialogue. So even though I had a headache on Wednesday, uh, I went back with renewed uh, commitment the next morning to send out the assignment, because this is, this, this, is this is tough stuff, but it's also an opportunity. And we really think uh, uh, all, the, all the folks that practice dialogue under Joe's uh, leadership that this is an important thing. The last thing um, that I want to suggest, we have some handouts that you can take on the way out. I'll put them over on the piano, I think. That's a piano over there, right? Um, these are actually really decent things that came from uh, whatsessential.org that's focusing on kind of basic elements and attributes of dialogue. It's pretty, it's pretty cool. Very simple, straightforward, accessible language. Um, so they can be guides for us to figure out how to get this stuff off the ground and stay engaged. Um, but it's also something that we can pass out to other people. And, you know, when I start thinking about people and where they are in terms of engaging, I might hand somebody something like this and get their read. You know, what do you think about this? Does this sound interesting? If they say, yeah, that sounds kind of cool. I've been wondering how to do this with people like you. Um, that's a signal to me, right? That they might be interested. And so if I've read it before, I can say, well, you know, this is some of the stuff that we can do. Um, look at every opportunity, and I'm also saying, even with people who we think we agree with, look at every opportunity when we engage with other people as an opportunity to listen deeply. To not just assume that because, for example, people are coming to the same conclusion we are, um, that they have a tight, coherent story and a way of making sense of that issue. This is strong sense critical thinking, another thing that we uh, push for in the intergroup dialogue classes. Everybody has room to grow especially people around us. Ask and invite other people to ask us hard questions. Don't take even anything we're saying for granted. That really helps me think more deeply and clearly about stuff. So the question about dialogue versus debate that came up earlier is wonderful, because it invites me to think and pull in more stuff to make things transparent and clear for myself and for other people. So um, these are wonderful, I think, um, resources that people can tap into for next steps. The Deborah Flick thing is, again, one of the things that we assign in class. The, um, so that said, really appreciate um, folks' time and willingness to stick, in, st stick with us this afternoon, go over time. Um, I'm also, the last thing that I'll say, let's not forget anyone. The people that we typically don't talk to are probably the ones that, if we're not talking to them, working with them, engaging with them, who is, who has. So there are people that we've forgotten. And I think, you know, where there's a void, what happens? So I think these skills and what we're talking about in terms of bridging divides, making connections and sustained connections and relationship over time is an imperative, not just between now and the next presidential election cycle, um, but probably for the next decades to come. Scott, anything else? Thank you so much.